Let's take our Bibles, turn to Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, if you would. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and a couple of things uh, to mention before we read our uh, scripture this morning. I uh, had to reschedule our planned uh, barbecue trip. Of course, uh, that was uh, supposed to be this past Thursday, but because of the storm, felt it wise to uh, uh, postpone that. We're going to try to see if this will work for uh, enough folks. We'll try to uh, do that next Friday, uh, September 13th. And uh, the sign-up list is uh, there on the Sunday School office door. And if that'll work for most folks, and we'll attempt that again, I realize it's impossible to come up with a time that, uh, or a day that would be good for everybody. So we'll just attempt that and see how that works. So make sure that you uh, sign up if you would like to go on that. And then I got a text from uh, Jonathan Buecher this morning. And uh, he did make it safely to uh, New Hampshire last Thursday. Drove all night after being here Wednesday night. Had to be up there on Thursday morning for an appointment. And uh, he did make it safely. And uh, he is supposed to be flying out of Boston in the morning or sometime tomorrow uh, heading to Israel. And uh, he mentioned that when he was here uh, that uh, he'd be going there soon. So... Uh, pray for him and his uh, safety as he flies, and uh, he'll be able to, uh, uh, to get uh, the training and everything that uh, he's looking for there in Israel as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and we'll read verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we are thankful for every blessing that you've given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful especially for the salvation that uh, you provided in him. Lord, we pray that if there would be anyone in the service with us today that has never come to him, may this be the day, may the Holy Spirit of God impress upon their hearts the urgency of their coming to him and trusting Him as their Savior. And I pray you'd help all of us that are saved to be yielded to you and your will and your purpose in our lives. May we honor you, and we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ would be magnified in our lives uh, as individuals, in our life as a church. We pray that we would honor Him in all that we do. In His name and for His sake we pray. Amen. Message is going to be a little bit different today than uh, what we would normally uh, uh, try to do. Uh, and, and this verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1, gives us the, uh, the principle that uh, I want us to think about. I was thinking earlier that uh, this is one of those verses and on into uh, really the following uh, verses down through verse 8. You see that a lot of times, especially verse 1, in plaques and different things that people put on their wall, you know, for decorations. Uh, to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. I remember when I was a teenager, there was a rock group that uh, put out a song based on Ecclesiastes 3. And uh, if I remember right, it became one of the hits of the day. Uh, but that, that is not uh, the reason God gave us this verse. Uh, not uh, th this, this passage as a whole here. Certainly, uh, God uh, didn't give that to us so we could uh, just look at it as an ornament on the wall. Uh, there's a principle, there's a truth that uh, these verses uh, remind us of and is a very basic truth that uh, we have in the Bible. And one of the, I believe the main truth and principle that we see uh, from these verses, and in particular verse 1, is that uh, things change. Uh, you know, really only God remains the same, doesn't He? Uh, everything else uh, is subject to change. To everything there is a season and a time 
to every purpose under the heaven. And then in verses 2 through 8, uh, we have 14 contrasting things uh, that express the reality of the seasons or the times in life. For example, in verse 2 it says, a time to be born and a time to die. There's a season of life and there's a season of death. Now that's a huge change, isn't it? Matter of fact, it'd be hard uh, to imagine a more drastic change than that of life and death. And uh, those are part of the seasons of life. And it's interesting that verse 2 mentions birth and death, a time to be born and a time to die. And it doesn't, doesn't say anything about the life in between in that verse, does it? A time to be born, a time to die. Matthew Henry, the great commentator, uh, suggested that that's possibly because of the uh, reality of the brevity of life. Life is short, isn't it? Especially when you think about eternity. Uh, the life that we have here on this earth is uh, microscopic in the light of eternity. James chapter 4 and verse 14 would uh, certainly bear that out, wouldn't it? Where James says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. So life is short, isn't it? Uh, the verses that follow, uh, Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1, uh, as I mentioned, they describe the certain changes that life brings. When you're born, uh, your life from that point on is going to be uh, a life of changes. And even in the natural course of things, the natural creation, uh, we see the reality of uh, change. Uh, for example, day turns into night. Night turns into day. That's designed by God, by the way. And uh, then that repeats itself. And uh, you think about a longer span, uh, the seasons. Uh, spring turns into summer. And summer gives way to autumn, doesn't it? And then autumn uh, changes into winter. And then winter uh, yields to spring again. And that cycle is repeated. That cycle has repeated since God created the earth. And uh, so this world and everything in it uh, is subject to change and different seasons. And as change comes into our lives, uh, that requires us that we make adjustments to those changes, doesn't it? Uh, your life has uh, been, been uh, a life of adjusting. If things always stayed the same, you'd never have to adjust. You'd, you'd never have to make changes in your life. And it's critical in, uh, in our lives that those adjustments or those responses to change. Uh, it's critical for us that uh, we respond in such a manner uh, to those seasons and those changes uh, in such a manner that God is pleased. And uh, again, especially as Christians, as, as believers, uh, those adjustments and, and those responses to the various seasons and changes in life and uh, the changes that they require of us as we go through life, they go a long way in, in revealing our level of maturity in our lives. Uh, you ever stop to think about how I react and how I uh, adjust to the various changes that uh, take place in life, uh, that has a lot to do with where I'm at in my Christian life. 
And if we are mature as believers, then we should uh, respond uh, in maturity, shouldn't we? Uh, if, we if, if we're weak, if we're carnal in our Christian lives, then oftentimes uh, the responses that we have uh, to certain changes, any change really, uh, will reveal that carnality. Uh, last week, I believe it was, I mentioned uh, along these same lines uh, examples of Job and Paul. Things did not stay the same for Job, did he? Uh, or, or did they? How did he respond? He worshiped God. Uh, you remember we read that uh, in all of that, and he lost everything that he had, in all of that, uh, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now that'd be a positive response, wouldn't it? And then Paul, we use the example in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul had that thorn in the flesh, and three times he besought the Lord that he would take it from him. And the Lord uh, did not do that. And how did Paul respond? He said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so Job responded, or uh, Paul, to that particular change in a manner that was pleasing and glorifying to God. In addition to those two examples, I, I, I want to give you another one to think about, Joseph. Joseph, his life did not remain the same, did it? And a big turning point in his life was when his brothers, uh, motivated by their envy and their jealousy, his brothers sold him to the Midianites, and the Midianites in turn sold him to Potiphar uh, in Egypt. And Joseph went from basically everything being great in his life to his life being a slave in Egypt. How, did that, how would you respond to that? Well, what if you went from a condition in your life of having, and I believe this would be true of Joseph, I believe prior to that, he didn't have much care in the world. Everything was provided for him and, and everything was going good for Joseph. And then in, in a moment, that changed. How would you respond if uh, something like that happened to you? Well, it got worse for Joseph. Not only was he sold uh, to Potiphar as a slave, you remember the false accusations that Potiphar's wife uh, brought against Joseph and he ended up being in prison. Imprisoned, innocent, no, nowhere near guilty of what he was accused of. And so, uh, boy, that was a change. And Joseph maintained a testimony uh, continually of trust in God. In Genesis 39 and verse 1, it says this, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, uh, which had brought him down thither. I said Midianites early, the Ishmaelites. And uh, Potiphar bought him. He was a slave. And even though things changed in a drastic way in Joseph's life, God had not abandoned him. And that's one of the things that the devil loves to deceive us with is that when things go from what we perceive to be good to what we perceive to be bad, the devil loves to get us to think, well, God doesn't care for me anymore. God's, God's forgot about me. God has abandoned me. And that is not so. And we read in Genesis 39 and verse 2, verse 2, this is after... Uh, Joseph's brethren have come down to Egypt. You remember the drought, the famine and everything, and they needed food, went down to Egypt. And God really had raised up Joseph to oversee all of that. And uh, because of that, and because of Joseph's wisdom and skill and, and uh, preparing and taking care of everything there, Egypt had plenty of food and uh, 
uh, Jacob and his sons had heard about that. They go down uh, to try to, to, to buy food. And uh, you know how eventually uh, Joseph recognizes them. And uh, later on, he reveals himself to them as their brother. After Jacob dies, those brothers, they begin to think, well, the only reason he's been kind to us thus far is because of our father Jacob. Now that he's dead and gone, Joseph is going to seek revenge because of what we did to him. And that's not the case. In Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, Joseph says this. He's talking to his brethren and he says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. They meant evil and God meant it for good. Boy, Joseph, uh, his response to those changes in his life, uh, they, they honored God all the way through that. And so Joseph certainly uh, underwent some uh, changes in his seasons, didn't he? To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And I just want to talk with you a little bit this morning uh, and apply this, uh, th th this principle here uh, to our situation here. We're undergoing uh, a change in our church. And uh, you're aware of that. A transition from one pastor to another. And we should remember that really that's a normal thing. That happens in life. Uh, in the life of churches, that happens. Some churches, it happens more often than others. Uh, some, it uh, you know, happens not too often. And people have sometimes mentioned to me that it's unusual for me uh, to have been here as long as I have. And I'm grateful for that, uh, that time. Last month, August, marked our 41st year of being here and serving you. August of 1978 is when we came. Boy, that was a, that was a change in our lives. You talk about a season of change. That was. And it's been my joy and, and privilege to serve as your pastor since February of 1981. We've been here since August of 78 and uh, serving as your pastor since February of 1981. And when people mention that about it being unusual for somebody to be here, be in a church that long, I usually try to respond, and I believe I always do, uh, to those comments by saying that, that my time here is a testimony more than anything to the grace and the patience of the people of this church. Uh, and I mean that with all my heart. Uh, you have been very, very gracious and uh, very patient with me. I, I think about, uh, you know, people and myself and... Uh, I, I have to come to the conclusion sometimes that if, if I were in your place, I don't know that I would have been as patient with me as you have been. Uh, but you have been, and I appreciate that, and I'm very grateful uh, for that. And having said that, let me say this, I trust that as a church, you will show Brother Monteith that same grace and patience. Uh, and, and that reminds me that uh, God, and I've said this many, many times, 
and uh, we see examples of it through the scriptures, God's work is bigger than any one individual. And I, I try to always remember that uh, Maranatha Baptist Church does not belong to Dale Coffey. Dale Coffey is not the head of Maranatha Baptist Church. The Lord Jesus Christ owns it. He's the one that shed His blood and purchased us with that blood. We belong to Him. And Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that He is the head of the church. And so uh, we're wise to remember that and, and try to uh, yield ourselves to that truth. And again, uh, I, I'm reminded often that, that God's work is bigger than any one of us, myself included, certainly. And I thought again of Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, And after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Now, the, the, the application and the similarities there would certainly be limited. I would never compare myself to Moses. And, and a very obvious uh, difference would be, I'm not dead yet. Moses was. Uh, but the point is this. Uh, Moses, the servant of the Lord, did die. But God's work went on, didn't it? God's work continued. And uh, Joshua, uh, the Lord spoke to Joshua and said, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people. Uh, and so... Uh, God's work does go on. And for me personally, it would be foolish and it would be very naive for me to think that I could or that I should remain as pastor of this church perpetually. Uh, and I'm grateful for the time that God has, has given us here. Extremely grateful. But uh, seasons do change, don't they? And, uh, and there comes a time when uh, uh, leadership uh, has to change. And of course, that's, uh, that's been uh, my decision between me and the Lord. And uh, the Lord has um, really been working in my heart uh, for, for some time about that. I'm not going to take the time to go into all of that uh, right now, but uh, certainly not something that I jumped into uh, quickly or carelessly. Uh, and I'm convinced uh, that this is uh, God's will uh, for us. And if you'd allow me, I'd like to just reminisce a little bit with you this morning. And, and the, one of the reasons I want to do this is just to uh, illustrate the truth of Galatia, of uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 3.1, to everything there is a season and to every purpose under heaven. And uh, I just want to share with you how the Lord worked uh, in my life and He's brought about more than one change in my life. And I'm grateful for that. I was saved uh, when I was 18 years of age. I've told you that before. In the summer of 1972, I just graduated from high school. And uh, that summer is when I got saved. And I'd grown up in church. Uh, my mom and dad uh, took me faithfully to church and I heard uh, the gospel preached uh, week after week, and God dealt, had been dealing with my heart for a long time. And I kept resisting. 
Uh, I kept saying no to the Lord. I knew that I needed to be saved. And there, there were very few days, and in particular nights, when I'd go to sleep or lay down to go to sleep at night, I would uh, have that fear of dying because I knew that uh, if I were to die in my sleep, I would spend eternity in hell. That was a reality to me. And, and the thing about it is, I was, a, as far as people were concerned uh, in our neighborhood, people that knew us, knew me, uh, they would always say, Dale Coffey, yeah, he's, he's a good little boy. He's a good boy. And uh, that's because my mom and dad kept a tight leash on me. I didn't like it then, but I'm glad for it now. And I don't know what uh, misery and what trouble that uh, spared me had they not done that. But the fact that I was a good little fella, uh, even, you know, to a degree, good teenager in the minds of people, uh, the problem with that is they couldn't see my heart. God does, just like God sees all of ours. And no matter how good we may be outwardly or uh, how good people may think we are, God certainly knows the truth about us, doesn't He? And, uh, you know, I, I was not the exception to Romans 3.23, which says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That meant me. Uh, just like verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. That meant me. And so uh, it, it wasn't a matter of what people were thinking about me. It was what God knew about me. And the Holy Spirit of God uh, convicted me and, and uh, convinced me that I was a sinner, guilty before God, and that Jesus Christ came, sent by God, uh, to go to the cross of Calvary for Dale Coffey. And uh, in, in, in the summer of 1972, uh, that I, I had been procrastinating uh, week after week after week after week. And uh, this thought would go through my mind just about every week. Well, I know I need to be saved, but I'll do it next week. Next week would come, I'd say the same thing. I know I need to, but I'll, I'll get saved next week. And uh, finally, uh, when I was 18, uh, I, I put that aside and uh, realized that if I was going to get saved, I needed to do it then. And uh, by God's grace... I got saved, and almost immediately, I began to have a desire in my heart to learn the Bible. I had no interest. I'd tried to read it before. Uh, you know, January, New Year's come. I'd, uh, it was a thing to do, read the Bible through in a year, and I thought, well, I'll try that. I, I never got close to getting out of the book of Genesis. I'd read two or three chapters of it, and boy, that'd be it. That, that didn't go long. But after I got saved, I, I really, uh, genuinely wanted to learn more of the Bible. And so I got involved in a Bible study through some friends that uh, a lady by the name of Miss Smith had in our area there. Her brother, David Bragg, uh, was a high school teacher at uh, Tennessee Temple Schools in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'd never heard. I, di I didn't know anything about a Christian school anywhere. Uh, had no, no thought of that, no desire uh, prior to that, about any of that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, uh, through her, uh, I heard about uh, Tennessee Temple. Uh, her brother worked there as a teacher. I think he was also the director of uh, Camp Joy, a church that, uh, or not a church, but a camp that uh, Highland Park Baptist Church had at the time. And uh, I, uh, I started thinking, you know, maybe, maybe that's what I ought to do. 
I want to learn more of the Bible, and uh, that, that'd be a good, good place to do that. And prior to that time, all I ever wanted to do was be a forest ranger or a game warden. Uh, I loved being outside. I still do. Uh, I loved being in the woods uh, or by the creek bank somewhere. That is all I ever <laughs> wanted to do. I mean, I could have spent every waking hour, daylight, out in the woods and, or fishing or whatever and, and never get tired of that. The farthest thing from my mind at that stage in my life was being involved in something that would require me to stand in front of people and, and especially speak. If you'd have told me that's what I was going to end up doing, uh, that I'd have laughed at you and said, there is no way, absolutely no way I'm going to do that. Uh, but I ended up enrolling, accepted at uh, Temple, started in January of 1973. Boy, that was, a, that was a change for me, a big change. One of the changes, one of the seasons uh, that changed in my life was, uh, I honestly, I'd, I'd never dated anybody in my life. I was scared to death of girls. And uh, that, that was just my... Matter of fact, when I went off to Tennessee Temple, I remember my grandfather, or one of them had said, yeah, we know what you're going to do. You're going to go down there to that school and you're going to come back married. And I said, not me. Uh, I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul. That's what I told them. I, you know, they were... Somebody told me that Paul wasn't married, and so I responded in that way. Well, I don't know, the first week, maybe the second week that uh, I was there, I met Pat. Met her in church. And uh, I, uh, boy, I was, I was, I was done. <laughs> I mean, that, that business of being like Paul, it didn't take long for that to uh, change. And so uh, we ended up getting married in December of 1973 and I've told you before about how I was so backwards and my you think I talk bad now I've told you that when I would call her dorm to ask her to sit with me in church or whatever her dorm mates would gather around the phone and listen to that hillbilly and uh, I didn't know it but they were laughing at me she told me all this later. But uh, that changed. We got married December of 1973. And uh, here's another reason why that's so important to me. And by the way, I thank God that I did meet her, that the Lord allowed us to uh, cross paths. And I thank her uh, for the wife that she's been since we've been here. And uh, I don't know what I'd do uh, without her. Through her, I met Brother Jeff Alverson. His last semester at uh, Tennessee Temple was my first semester there. And uh, we were there, you know, our times overlapped just that one semester. But uh, she knew him better than I did. She'd been there longer than I had. And uh, he graduated in the spring of 1973. I graduated from the Bible school. At that time, Temple consisted really of three different divisions. The Bible school, which uh, Dr. Robertson started in 1946 uh, for the purpose of training uh, preachers that had been perhaps saved or called to preach late in life and did not have uh, college education and uh, could not be accepted in uh, most colleges. Uh, well, that didn't mean they couldn't preach. Didn't mean they couldn't serve God, so he had a burden to start the Bible school. And uh, that was a three-year uh, program. And, and then, uh, you know, they had also the college and the seminary. But I graduated from the Bible school in 1976 and stayed two more years and uh, graduated from the, the college in August of 1978. 
And in December of 1975, Brother Doug, some of you others can correct me on that. I think that's when y'all first began to meet. December of 1975, there was a group of people here on the peninsula uh, that began to meet uh, with a desire of uh, starting a church and they called Brother Alverson to uh, be their pastor. And he came, he moved down here, and uh, this church was organized in February of 1976. And uh, Brother Alverson, of course, was their first pastor and uh, led them in that organizing of the church. In the spring of 1978, Brother Alverson uh, called, called me and asked me, uh, asked me and Pat if we'd pray about coming and serving as his youth director. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I'd spent nearly five years there at Tennessee Temple and I had no clue. And I was graduating uh, from the college there and uh, that was in the spring of 78, August of 78, I, uh, you know, because of courses that I needed had to uh, finish up in the summer and uh, graduating in August, but I had absolutely no clue what I was going to do, where I was going to go. I painted uh, on the uh, paint crew there at the school at that time, and as far as I knew, that's what I was going to continue to do. But he called and asked us if we could pray about coming and serving as his youth director, and we came down to visit in the summer of 1978, and I remember the first time I drove, we drove across uh, the James River Bridge coming into Newport News. I pretty much overwhelmed. And uh, we came, visited the church, and uh, we loved it here. Loved it. And I, I could say, well, it was the only opportunity I had, so I had to take it. That's not, I didn't have to take it. Uh, we took it because we wanted to. And we loved it and we were uh, thrilled about the opportunity to uh, serve uh, with Brother Alverson. And we went back home. We prayed about it and believed that this is where the Lord would have us. So I told Brother Alverson that we would come. And I graduated from Bible, uh, the, the college in August of 78 on a Thursday night. And that next morning, I got on an airplane, the Chattanooga airport, for the first time in my life, I got on an airplane. And that's another thing, that if somebody had said a few years before that, one day you're going to fly in an airplane, I'd have said, you're crazy. You've lost your mind. No way am I getting in an airplane. But uh, I think I've mentioned before that, uh, that that's one indication that I knew that that's what God wanted us to do is getting in that airplane. Uh, had I had any doubts about that, I'd have never got in it. But we flew down and, uh, or I flew down and uh, one of the men of the church uh, uh, took us around. Find, I, we finally found a house and everything. So we moved down here the following Thursday. That was on a a Friday morning that I flew down here, and the next Thursday, we were over on Candlewood Drive in Hampton, uh, moving in. And uh, the church couldn't support us full time uh, that first year we were here. Uh, I think they paid paid me fifty dollars a week at that time, and so I taught school over at uh, Central Baptist uh, School in Hampton, uh, Bible and English. That's another joke as well. Uh, not the Bible part. I love that. And uh, I might have been qualified a little bit to teach Bible, but uh, being qualified to teach English, that shows you how desperate they were uh, to have somebody in that English class. And Brother Alverson had... Uh, he, he pretty much had arranged that with Brother Hall, who was the pastor there at the time, uh, for me to teach. And uh, after the first year, the, the church took us on full time. 
and uh, Pat taught at Central that year, uh, the second year. And uh, then in December of 1980, Brother Iverson uh, called me into his office and he told me that he was going to be leaving. He was going to be taking a church and to pastor in South Carolina. And that he was going to recommend to the church that they call me as pastor. And boy, that was a shock too. There's another season, another change coming. Uh, and in February of 78, uh, not February of 78, but in February of 1980, 1981, I'll get it right in a minute. Uh, Brother Alberson resigned on a Sunday night. And the following Wednesday night, the church called me as interim pastor. And the next Sunday night was Brother Alberson's life service. And so uh, they called me as interim pastor, as I said. And then in April, uh, a couple of months later, they voted uh, for me to be pastor. And it's been my privilege to try to serve uh, as pastor since that time. And it's interesting, I was thinking about this this morning. It's interesting how the Lord has used Brother Alverson in all of this. Uh, not only what I just related to you about, uh, you know, me being acquainted with him and, and uh, getting to know him through Pat and then uh, him inviting us to come, but uh, due to his military ministry with BIMI, uh, he's been associated with Brother and Sister Monteith as well. And when I related to him about Brother Monteith uh, serving here and you calling him to assume the pastorate, uh, he was glad and he was excited to hear about that. And I got an email from him recently, uh, and I just want to read you a part of that. He says, Dear Brother Coffee, thank you for you. I'd written written a letter, and Brother Monteith had written a letter to our missionaries about, um, uh, you know, the transition and so forth. And uh, he says, Thank you for your kind letter announcing the pastor transition at NBC. I have known Brother Monteith for many years and worked in missions with him and his family very closely. You could not find a better man to follow your ministry there. And uh, I am so grateful for that. And uh, I, uh, I texted Brother Alverson again this morning and uh, thanked him. You know, I know the Lord is in charge of everything. Uh, but I thanked him for uh, giving me a chance, giving me an opportunity. Uh, he really took a chance on me. I had no experience. Still, I was 24 years old when I came up here. Had never worked with young people in my life. Was about as backward as anybody could be. But he, uh, he gave me a chance. And I texted him again this morning. And uh, thanked him for that. And so... Uh, that's been a pretty long season. Uh, to everything, there is a season. But seasons do change, don't they? And uh, that's not a bad thing. You know, honestly, as far as the weather is concerned, I don't know that I'd want to live in a place where uh, it's always hot. Matter of fact, I know I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, always, uh, I, I'm glad when fall comes and the, the seasons uh, do change. And so this, this season of my being pastor here is coming to a close. And it's in my heart to still serve. Uh, and I want to serve and uh, help Brother, Brother Monteith any way I can. Uh, that he desires, but not as pastor. And uh, we all need to understand that. Not as pastor. That, that season is coming to an end. And while I no longer will be pastor, 
uh, it is our plan, our desire to stay here as members of the church and serve uh, as we can. And I, I, I want to give you a little story on that too. And I know it's a little past 12. We won't be too much longer. Uh, <clears throat> while uh, uh, that was my desire to do that, I never mentioned anything to Brother Monteith about that. Uh, because I didn't want I didn't want to come across as putting a seed in his mind, thinking that uh, I wanted him to ask me to stay. Most of the time, that does not work. Uh, well, I, I don't know that I should say most of the time. A lot of times, uh, when a pastor stays after he's been pastor, then uh, you know it uh, it doesn't work. But our, my heart was to stay. And uh, I think it can work. And it can be uh, that that God would, would, uh, would bless. Uh, but it was not my original intent to stay because I didn't, uh, I didn't want to run that risk and I didn't want uh, uh, to even suggest to him that uh, that uh, was what my desire was. And one day we were sitting in the office back there and we were talking about the church and the ministry and everything and I don't even remember how it came up now but uh, he, he mentioned to me that it was his mind and his heart for me to stay and I felt like shouting because that's what I wanted to do and uh, that, that was the desire of my heart and I'm grateful to him uh, for that. And, uh, you know, I am. I mean that from my heart. And I've told him several times that I'll, I'll not cause him any difficulty. Uh, I, I would leave before I did that. Uh, but any way that I can serve and, and uh, serve him and uh, serve in any capacity, you know, here, then I'd certainly desire and look forward to do that. Now, having said all of that, uh, and, and let, let me just ask you to pray uh, um, about this. I meant to mention it earlier, uh, something that would be a personal prayer request uh, that I'd appreciate you remembering is that uh, uh, we, we uh, do plan to sell our house uh, one of the main reasons is uh, we need to get something that's one story. Uh, steps no longer uh, are very appealing to us. And uh, so we're, we, we want to get something uh, maybe downsized a little bit, something that uh, uh, you know, we could take care of easier. So, and I've got some things I need to do. Uh, to get the house ready to put on the market and try to sell it. So I'd appreciate you praying with us about that and would be grateful for that. But uh, during this transition, uh, let me just leave you with this and I'm done. Uh, what, 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 uh, again, going back to this principle, to everything there is a season. Uh, how, how are we going to adjust? How are we going to uh, respond, react? Uh, to this change? Well, one is this. Uh, we need to remain faithful. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And transition and change in the life of a church is a critical time. The devil would love to take advantage of that. And he often does. But uh, be faithful. Be faithful in prayer. Uh, that almost goes without saying, shouldn't it? Pray. Pray for uh, our church, our church family. As I've already asked you to pray for us. Uh, pray for the Monteith family. Keep them before the Lord. Keep, keep all of we're, we're supposed to be a church body, a family. You, know, you realize, you remember that? The Bible describes a local church in several ways, a body, a building, a family. 
Uh, so let's pray for one another. Be faithful in assembly. Uh, you know, in attendance. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Uh, we, we just need to make up our minds. We're going to be faithful uh, to uh, the house of God and assembling together uh, as a local assembly. Uh, we need to be faithful in our service. Boy, I'm so glad uh, to, to hear the good report of the Master's Club's meeting yesterday and the uh, people willing to serve and the enthusiasm. Uh, and and I, uh, let me say this too. Now, I'm not going to say everything that I'm eventually going to say today. I'm going to be saying some more things later on. Uh, but I am absolutely convinced of this. Uh, Brother Monteith is going to lead us in the right direction. And uh, uh, there, there's going to be, he, he's going to change some things, I'm sure. Does that mean he's going to be wrong? Because he didn't do things the way I did? No, not at all. And I, I believe he's going to do a lot of things, a whole lot better than I could. Uh, and I, I'm not just saying that. That's just not trying to be a politician this morning. Uh, that's the truth. I believe that in my heart. Uh, and so we need to be faithful in service. One of the greatest testimonies that a Christian can have is that of Epaphras, uh, uh, Epaphras in Colossians 1, 7. It says, And ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Faithful minister, a faithful servant. Uh, just because there's a different season and there's a change uh, that's taking place, uh, that doesn't mean that we're supposed to quit serving the Lord. Let's be faithful in our service. And then another thing, stay focused. Uh, focused on God's purpose for us as a church. There are several passages in the Bible that uh, would uh, be appropriate here. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 18 through 21 uh, sums it up pretty well. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given, us, uh, given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God has given to us the ministry, the word of reconciliation. That's talking about our responsibility to the world. Let's, fo let's stay focused on that. Let's let that be a priority. And uh, it, again, if you focus on the reality that Brother Monteith is not me, then uh, you're going to get distracted. Uh, I wasn't Brother Alverson. Uh, and... Uh, you know, just because I might have done a few things different than he did, that doesn't mean he's wrong. I was thinking the other day, you know, Brother Monteith may, may change uh, order of service and everything. We've, we've been used to a certain way for 40 years, almost. And, uh, you know, he, he may change the way he wants to do the singing and all that. Does that mean he's a heretic? Uh, absolutely not. He'll do things differently. And it doesn't mean he's wrong because he does so. So let's stay focused. Let's stay focused on what God uh, has us here to do and uh, not let these uh, things distract us. And then another thing, and, I, and I'm done. Uh, we need to make sure that we grow in our love for one another and in Christ likeness. One of the greatest challenges to any church is found in Philippians 1, beginning in verse 9. Paul says this to them, 
And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Uh, let's increase in that. Let, let's allow Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit of God to make us more like Himself. And uh, ourselves, servants in His work and ministry. And so, again, to everything, there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven. And uh, let's remember that God does have a purpose and a plan uh, for each one of us. And uh, let's be yielded, submissive uh, to Him.